Thank you, Brother John. Glad to be back with you in Cedar Lake, Indiana at the BBF conference. And uh, happy Father's Day, all you fathers. And we thank God for all the mothers that have, through the Spirit of God, kept you in shape and in line for all these years. Glad to have you with us also. If you notice on your program, um, the way it's divided, we have basically two themes dealing with the distinctiveness of Paul's revelation and the different portions of his epistles dealing with these distinctives. By and large, they are taking place in the evening hours, uh, and then during the morning, we're looking at 2 Thessalonians. And that was an epistle of only three chapters. I remember last year we went through 1 Thessalonians and were able to do a whole conference, but for three chapters uh, we need a, a supplement, and that's an excellent one with Paul's distinctives. What we're doing this morning is kind of a kickoff of this little epistle, and it's a wonderful epistle. There are so many things of practical Christianity that, that springs from the doctrine that Paul brings forth concerning our blessed hope. And many people today are kind of belittling that idea of the coming of the Lord because it's been so long and people have expected this for 2,000 years. And yet I believe that every generation has had it within them this blessedness of the hope to keep them near to the heart of God knowing that he could appear at any moment for us. Well, I'd like to open to the book of 2 Thessalonians, and maybe it might be appropriate to review just in our hearts and minds uh, a little bit about the Thessalonian church. It was evangelized by Paul and his uh, helpers during the second apostolic journey. And you remember that after the first one, that there was a disagreement between him and the Apostle Barnabas concerning John Mark and accompanying them on that journey. And as it turned out, uh, Barnabas took John Mark to Cyprus with him, while Paul uh, chose Silas, and later Timothy was able to accompany him throughout all of Europe. Uh, Paul was at a little bit of a loss of what to do and where to go in this journey. He had his own idea, but the Lord had a change of plans. Uh, one night he had a vision, and in this vision he was able to see a man of Macedonia that was imploring him to come over to help them. And God, uh, of course, gave him in no uncertain terms that will that he was to go into Europe and not back into Asia. The first uh, place that they came to that was a major city was Philippi. And we know a great deal about the Philippians. There was also a letter written to them of uh, four chapters. And uh, during this time, uh, Paul went down to a place where there was prayer being wont to made at the riverside. And uh, he was able to preach the word of Christ to them. And Gloriously, God opened the heart of a young woman by the name of Lydia. And she was well off. She was a seller of purple. And uh, that was the first convert that we had in the continent of Europe. And shortly after that, there was a, a young lady that was a soothsayer. She was possessed with a spirit of python, of, of divination. And she was able to bring great wealth and money to her masters as a slave girl. And because of that burden, uh, she was set free. And, and Paul was able to cast out that demon. Unfortunately for the masters, they were not able to gain wealth from her anymore. And they stirred up the city against him. And they were able to take them into custody. And both Silas and Paul were whipped mercilessly because of their stand for Christ. And yet God was in it. He was working in them and through them for his glory and for man's good. And we saw that there was a great conversion of a jailer and his entire family. And boy, did they show evidence of their salvation. They were able to clean the wounds and uh, Paul and Barn uh, Silas were sent on their way. 
The second place that they came to as a major city was Thessalonica. And as Paul's custom was, he went in to the synagogue, preaching to the Jew first, and on three consecutive Sabbaths, he was able to speak to them concerning Christ, opening and alleging that that Christ must suffer and that he must raise again from the dead by the power of God, and that this Jesus who Paul was preaching was indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, there was a great conversion there as well. Some of the Jews believed, and uh, as the custom was, or as the, the pattern seemed to be in the book of Acts, there was a great company of Greeks, of Gentiles, that were obedient to the faith. And this became the nucleus of what we now know as the Thessalonian church. We think that perhaps these people were not as noble as the people in Berea. And indeed, the Jews were not. They were not interested in the word of God uh, as preached through Christ, but they wanted to maintain their tradition. And so they gathered up a great persecution against Silas and against Paul. And they were, by night, they were able to escape their clutches and went into Berea. We know shortly after that, that Timothy was sent back to confirm them in their faith. And they were encouraged that they were standing fast for the word of God and for the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> At the time of the writing of 1 Thessalonians, there was a problem. Uh, it was not a problem of their choosing or of their doing, but it was simply a circumstance that had come into the church that was kind of like throwing a monkey wrench into the machinery. And it was the fact that some of these people, the dear saints of God, fairly new converts, had died. And the relatives were wondering about the rapture. In the, that short time that Paul and Silas were with them, they were able to establish them in all of the fundamentals of the faith of Christianity, including the rapture, our blessed hope. And they began to wonder, I wonder if they are just gone if we're ever going to see them, if they are going to participate in this grand event that we're looking forward to. And fortunately, Paul was able to comfort their hearts that indeed they would see their loved ones, that in fact they themselves would be the first ones to rise at the time of Christ's coming, and that they also would be caught up in clouds in the air to be with them. And so should they ever be with the Lord. The scholars tell us that this second epistle was probably written within six months of the first one, and there was a related problem with uh, the edification of the saints there, again, not of their own fault, but uh, actually a letter that had come to their church, supposedly from Paul, that was saying that they had actually entered into the day of the Lord, and that all of the problems and the tribulations and the sufferings were a part of this great and terrible day of the Lord. Of course, Paul had no small dissension and disputation with that idea, and so he wrote this letter not only to give them assurance that that was not the case, but how they should act as children of God in the interim until he comes. So that's where we find ourselves here in 2 Thessalonians. Let me read this first paragraph as an introduction to our epistle and bring us up to speed on really Paul's heart for them and where they were spiritually in the Lord. <clears throat> Paul and Savannah and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, 
and that the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. The first thing that I see here is the name Paul. And he wrote 13 epistles of the New Testament. And we heard last night how many chapters of the book of Acts that that entailed with his ministry and testimony. And we look at Paul not simply as the apostle to the Gentiles, although that's true, but also as the apostle of the Gentiles. And that is possessive, that Paul belongs to us as Gentiles He is our apostle. To him was given a specific and distinct revelation concerning the grace of God, an entire period of time that we know as the dispensation of the grace of God. But another thing I notice is that Paul was not alone, that he saw the value and actually the necessity of a team effort in this work that we call the ministry. And I think many times that we as grace believers may fall into a bit of a trap because some of us are isolated from other grace believers and we think that perhaps we can um, do a solo effort. Well, I I think that there are mavericks out there that are doing a good job for the Lord according to the grace of God given to them. But when I read Paul's epistles to these seven churches, I see that he was intent in getting people grounded in a local assembly with other believers of like precious faith who will encourage them, instruct them, and have an avenue for them to have their ministry among the the entire group. And we need to learn to hold hands together as a body to, uh, to, to fight for the faith of the gospel. And it is a fight. There is a spiritual battle that God has for us to fight together. And it's as an army and not as a Rambo or somebody like that that thinks that they can go it alone. So Paul and Silas, um, Silas was indeed an apostle, as was Timothy in the secondary sense of the word. They were the same ones that were addressed in 1 Thessalonians. So we see that there is a consistency there that both of these gentlemen were well respected and loved by the Thessalonian church. Here we see that there is a security of the believers in Christ. Notice here that the first thing that we are that Paul puts to our mind is that we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a vital living union with the living God. And that is part of our position, that we have been taken out of Adam the first, we've been transplanted into Christ, been raised and seated with him in heavenly places, and that is our position as full-grown sons in the family of God. But notice here that it is also a vital union with God the Father. It tells us in our sevenfold unity of Ephesians uh, uh, 4 that God is in us all and through us all and working in us all. And that is a twofold union that God the Father is in us and we are in him. And there's, there is a mutual life there that we share. We share his righteousness, his acceptance, and his life. I think that brings us security. The first thing that the child of God needs to get settled in their own heart before they can minister to others is their relationship with God. How is it that we can know for sure that we are accepted by God? If it's something that is in us or something that we are trying to do for God, there's always going to be a doubt. 
If that security is based wholly and completely in the grace of God and what Christ has done, then there's not going to be any doubt in our hearts about that. And by the way, is it possible to have a relationship with somebody that you don't know where you stand with them? If you have doubts and you have fears about whether they love you or they accept you, how can you have any kind of a relationship? And God wants, above all else, to have a relationship with you. Well, this is a twofold security. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 says that we have died, and now our life is hid with Christ in God. That twofold security. Well, when we think about the Holy Spirit, that we have been sealed by that Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, now we have a threefold security. And the Bible says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. That is a cord that can never be broken. Thank God. Now, verse number two speaks of God's grace. And I believe that this is more than just a religious way of saying hello to the, to the saints. I believe that there is a deep doctrinal import in this verse. Grace to you and peace. And we understand that grace is from God. It is his gift that must be received by faith. Some have used the acrostic, God's riches at Christ's expense. And I think that's a good one. But here we see the joy and the delight for which God gives his gifts of grace. He gives it freely. He doesn't hold back anything. He doesn't want to withhold anything that is needful and uh, for our development as Christian people. Now, this peace of God, some have said that that's really the absence of hostility. And, and that's true. God has taken away all hostility in our relationship. But I also believe that God's peace is the presence of something, of his love, of his goodwill, of his willingness to go to all means to make sure that we mature in Christ as he has ordained us to do. Here we see that that Christian life is also a factor. We think of grace and peace and salvation, first of all, but these are Christian people, and God says that same grace that saved you is keeping you, is empowering you, is motivating you, to live for him who died for you and rose again. So it is with God's peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. But then Paul goes on to say that that peace also can rule and guard your heart by faith as we pray, as we present our request to him as those that are alive from the dead. And God gives the promise of that peace that passes all understanding. Amen? Wonderful. I notice also that the Lord Jesus Christ is always put on par with God the Father. In almost every apostolic greeting, in every epistle that he wrote, the grace, the peace, and in the pastoral epistles, his mercy, is extended not only by God the Father, but the Lord Jesus Christ. Not as some kind of second-hand deity or the first creation of God, but as co-equal with God the Father. And that gives me confidence that when I have Christ, I have everything that I need for life and godliness. Beginning with verse number three, I have entitled this, The Encouragement of Praise. 
As Christian people, I think we sometimes fail to understand how important that is to our spiritual development. That we be encouraged by those that we love and respect in the Lord. And Paul begins with thanksgiving, a very good place to start. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, because they were beloved of the Lord. And in that first epistle, remember in the last chapter, in chapter 5, verse 18, Paul commands them, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That is something that we can all do. And if you want to know what the will of God for your life is, this is the place to begin. And Paul begins to practice what he preached to the brethren in the previous letter. He says, I am bound to give thanks always for you, brethren, as it is fitting or meet, because, and then he gives some reasons. It wasn't just that they were saved, which was a cause for rejoicing, but also what the grace of God was doing in their lives. Not just an individual there or an individual over here, but the whole church had come together into the grace of God and had developed Christian character. Because your faith groweth exceedingly. Now that faith began as a small little seed that God planted. And then God began to water it, to fertilize it, and he used other men of God in this. Um, and after just a short period of time, they were growing like weeds. They, they were almost out of control that they loved the Lord so much, and their faith was getting stronger, deeper, more penetrating, and it was having an effect in that church, and it was unity. That your faith groweth exceedingly. In the original Greek, that is one word. It's the only place in the Bible where that word is found. And it's a superlative that talks about the overabounding faith that was growing in their lives. Well, that's wonderful to see. As we come back to 1 Thessalonians, here is a parallel passage in which Paul prayed for these new converts. And um, this is a good place to really see how God answers prayer, especially when it comes to spiritual issues. And let me just read this passage here to, to give an overview of where they were and where Paul wanted them to be. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear... We thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And you remember where Paul went after he left Thessalonica? Now, he went to Berea for a short time, and he presented the gospel there. But there's no account of a church being established there, even though they seem to be open with a ready mind to the word. Um, and then he went to Athens, and he was by himself in Athens, and we know that there was very little fruit that was established there uh, because they, were, they did not have a heart and mind for the gospel. But Paul was still concerned about the new church established in Thessalonica, so he sent Timothy uh, to minister, a minister of God, and our fellow... Um, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Why? To establish you. And that tells me that Paul was not content just to get people saved. He wanted them to be established and that those roots might go deeply into the fertile soil of God's grace. And that they might produce fruit. That it might be a, a multiplication of God's grace. And uh, when people get saved and excited and established in the faith, that is going to be like a spreading flame in their area of influence. And it certainly was. And also to comfort you, to encourage you, 
concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. We know the afflictions of the apostles. We read of that in the book of Acts, but not so much about the afflictions of the Thessalonians, other than here in the Thessalonian epistles that tells them that they were under tribulation, under pressure, persecution, and it was so intense that it could possibly be misinterpreted to be the outpouring of God's wrath. And that certainly was a misdiagnosis of the actual um, problem. That no man should be moved of these afflictions, for yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. How Paul was wise to warn them of the coming storm. And we that are in the business of winning souls need to also emulate Paul, I think, in this. We think in this country of America that we are immune from persecution. And to a certain degree, that has been the case. Uh, we thank God for uh, freedom of religion and freedom of assembly and freedom of the press and so forth. But let me tell you, brethren, that that persecution is real, even in America. It may be more subtle, uh, but it's very much there. And um, uh, Paul says that all that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. Maybe not to the extent that these people were, but if we are faithful in our proclamation, the uncompromised message of God's grace through Christ, there is going to be hostility of those that are in darkness. How many know of uh, an organization that's called the Voice of the Martyrs? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. And uh, overseas and even in the Americas, there are many Christians that are under a great fight of affliction for their faith. And we need to pray for those saints. It seems to be so far removed from us, but uh, those saints need our prayers. And, and sometimes I think we're remiss in remembering the persecuted church. Well, he goes on to say in verse 5, For this cause um, I could no longer forbear, and I sent to know of your faith, lest by any means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Now, I don't believe that Paul was thinking that perhaps these people would renounce their faith or lose their salvation. But certainly that tempter, that enemy, could take them as prisoner of war in this great conflict that we call the Christian life. I think Paul addresses that in other places, that there are those that are taken by the snare of the devil, and they are basically intimidated in their Christian life. And... Uh, Paul didn't want that to happen, so it was absolutely essential that Timothy and the other brethren step in uh, to stave off that, that persecution and reassure them that God was with them. I think in our Christian lives that the biggest, I could not maybe the biggest, but one of the biggest guns that the enemy uses against us is discouragement to beat us down, to say that God is no longer with you. And that's where Paul's doctrine of grace comes in so handily. In Romans chapter 8, it tells us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Put it down in your mind and, and etch it in stone that God is for you. God is for you, not against you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. But now when Timotheus came unto, you, unto us from you, and he brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, the same things addressed in Second Thessalonians. What was the reaction of Paul? And that you had good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, and we also to see you. 
Did you know that the truth brings an affection? That if a person rejects the truth, it's a hostility there. There, there, There's not a relationship there that can be commended. And many times, our, even our family members, will, there will be a hostility there because they don't believe the truth. Paul said later that all those which are in Asia have forsaken me. And I had a, a well-known preacher in the community years ago that I pointed that out to, that people had left the truth very early in the first century. And he said, well, they left Paul, but they kept his teaching. They loved his teaching, but they couldn't stand Paul. And I thought, how could that be? Um, The fact is that when people reject what you're preaching and what you're standing for, they will reject the message, but they'll also reject you. And you are not the issue. It's the Lord that's being rejected. And finally, Paul said, that is an encouragement to my heart in the midst of my persecution. Have you ever thought that one of the best ways that you can encourage your spiritual leaders is by standing fast and firmly for the word of God rightly divided? What an encouragement that is to your pastor. That's what he's there for. That's his goal Not just to get you saved, but to get you established in the truth. Now, Paul begins to talk about what is the epitome of that spiritual growth. The old King James uses the word charity, but it's actually the Greek word agape, which means God's love. And... um, There's an interesting thing here about love, that it goes hand in glove with our faith. That also the love of every one of you toward all is overabounding. And uh, that is the one thing above all Christian graces that tells us that we are becoming like Christ. And remember that love is not an emotion It is the willingness to do for others what Christ has already done for you. It's that willingness to be obedient to the faith and to love even the unlovable. Years ago, there was an old preacher by the name of John Henry Jowett, and he wrote an epistle on the, uh, uh, the writings of Peter. And uh, under this heading, that true love is a splendid host, he says this. There is a love whose measure is that of an umbrella. There is a love whose inclusiveness is that of a grand marquee. And there is a love whose comprehension is that of the immeasurable sky. The aim of the New Testament is the conversion of the umbrella into the tent and of the merging of the tent into this glorious canopy of an all-enfolding heavens. And then he says this, push back the walls of family love until they include your neighbor. Again, push back the walls until they include the stranger. And again, push back the walls until they comprehend the foe. I think of Paul and his dealings with God. Here was a man that was a persecutor. He hated Christians. He killed them. He he compelled them to blaspheme the name of Christ. And yet, even in the midst of that hatred and hostility, the chief enemy of God on earth was gloriously saved, and he was turned from an enemy into a friend, into a proclaimer of God's grace. I think that example of Saul of Tarsus becoming the Apostle Paul is the example for us today in our relationships with each other.
And you can probably think of somebody that just turns you the wrong way, the way they move, the way they talk, the way they address you, and it, you just can't wait to get away from them. Maybe somebody in your church. And uh, it's easy to love the world, and yet um, in our lives, it's, 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 it's the neighbor that throws the limbs over the fence into your yard. That's the guy that's hard to love. But God wants us to love the unlovable. We think of 1 Corinthians 13 as the great love chapter in Paul's writings, and it, indeed it is, because there Paul describes what love is and what love does. Some time ago I came across this quotation. It's from a magazine called The South African Pioneer. I'm not familiar if that's still in publication, but I take it to be a missionary uh, magazine. And uh, whoever wrote this, it, it was really good, I thought, because it takes 1 Corinthians 13 and puts it into a contemporary setting. He says, if I have the language perfectly and speak like a native, and have not his love for them, I am nothing. If I have diplomas and degrees and know all the up-to-date methods and have not his touch of understanding love, I am nothing. If I am able to argue successfully against the religions of the people and to make fools of them and have not his wooing note, I am nothing. If I have all faith and great ideals and magnificent plans and have not the love that sweats and bleeds and weeps and prays and pleads, I am nothing. If I give my clothes and my money to them and have not his love for them, I am nothing. If I surrender all prospects, leave home and friends, and make the sacrifices of a missionary career, and turn sour and selfish amid the daily annoyances and the slights of the missionary life, and have not the love that yields its rights, its leisures, its pet plans, I am nothing. Virtue has ceased to go from me. If I can heal all manner of disease and, and, uh, and sickness and yet wound hearts and hurt feelings for the want of God's love that is kind, I am nothing. If I can write articles and publish books and win, win applause but fail to transcribe the word of the cross into the language of his love, I am nothing. Yes, love gives. It is self-sacrificial. And we have to give up something to really love as Christ has loved us. It is also unconditional. God never says, I'm going to love you if you do this, this, and that, and that. He says, I love you just because I love you. That's who I am. And Paul tells us that the love of Christ has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And to say, I can love that man, the man that despises me, it's impossible. But God says, in my spirit, in my love, it is possible. There is a remedy, people, and it's Christ. Finally, we look at the sufferings of the cross as revealed in Paul, but also in his converts, so that we ourselves glory in the churches of God for the patience and faith in all the persecutions and tribulations which you endure. This little word glory is a very interesting. It's sometimes translated to boast or to brag. Sometimes it's translated to rejoice. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And I think both of those meanings are very well present in our verse 4. Paul was rejoicing over them, and he was bragging about them to other churches. 
And uh, that was an inspiration. And I think that we believers, as grace believers, should not be so proud as to not learn from other churches or even other people that may not rightly divide. Hmm. That might open some thoughts. I thank God for some of the helps that I've gotten from other people that don't understand the distinctiveness of Paul's revelation. And uh, I thank God for the truth that we do stand for, but uh, we don't have a monopoly on the truth, and we can learn from others, other churches and and, um, other influences that God is in. And when I think of God's suffering, I I think of the statement that, that Paul made that he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. And God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter what Paul did, he never gloried in the flesh. He always hid himself behind the cross and allowed the glory of God to shine through. And you might say, well, maybe Paul is out of character here for boasting about these people. But I tend to believe that when Paul saw that which was praiseworthy in them, he was actually seeing Christ in them, living in them and through them for God's glory. And so it's not a contradiction. And I think that maybe it's not beyond our means to commend others that are standing fast for the Lord and are living a life consistent with God's grace. Not that we glory in the flesh, but what God is doing in their lives. Finally, when we think about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, Dr. M. R. DeHaan, one of the great preachers from the 19th century, uh, wrote a little book called Broken Things. And this is what he says about the sufferings for Christ and how God can use them. And he uses this analogy. A little piece of wood once complained bitterly because its owner kept whittling away at it, cutting it, filling it with holes. (laughs) And the one who was cutting it was so unremorsedly uh, paid no attention to the complaining of the little stick. He was making a flute out of that little piece of ebony, and he was too wise to desist from doing so, even though the wood was complaining bitterly. He seemed to say, little piece of wood, without these holes and all the cutting, you would be but a black stick forever, just a useless piece of ebony. What I am doing now may make you think that I am destroying you, But instead, I will change you into a flute. And your sweet music will charm the souls of men and comfort many a sorrowing heart. My cutting you is the making of you, for only thus can you be a blessing to the world. God is taking his stick, which is the body of Christ. He's whittling anything that's not the image of Christ. And he's taking that dross and he's doing away with it through pain and suffering and tribulation. And we may not be suffering as these believers are, but we all have our pain, don't we? Maybe you're here without, you've lost your job. Maybe there's been a devastating diagnosis of some illness, and it's not one that's easy to treat. Maybe you have a loved one that has uh, flown the coop, and and you pray, and you don't seem to see any change in that person. God can use that pain as his whittling to whittle away the dross and anything that will bring us into a state of Christ-likeness. Let us not complain bitterly against the master and the use of his means. Yes, the circumstances are hard, and sometimes they're the result of our own bad choices. God can even use those for his honor and glory. And someday we're going to look back in hindsight, and we'll be able to thank God 
for these trials and these persecutions and these sufferings. Let's go to him and give thanks in advance for what he's doing through us. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we think of the introduction to this blessed epistle, we think of how far you have brought us through all the trials and the vicissitudes of our life. We know that you have been faithful and that you are trying to produce your faithfulness in us and through us. We know many times that you choose to do that through the cauldron of suffering, whether it be for the name of Christ, whether it be physical sufferings or just emotional ones. We pray that we not balk at your means that you have chosen to make us into a beautiful flute that can make music for your honor and glory. We pray, our Father, that we might see with the eye of faith behind the scenes, that we might get your perspective, that we can rejoice in sufferings, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience tested character, and that brings us right back to your love. We thank you, Father. We give you praise. Amen.